Father, we just thank you for this beautiful day. Just pray that you'd bless us richly in your word and uh, our fellowship with one another and with you. Lord, I just pray that as we read it, we'll take it to heart, realize uh, the same thing is going on in America many, many years after all of this was written. I just pray that we'd be faithful to pray, to get close to you, to share you with others, to be as uh, faithful as we can possibly be. And I just pray you'd open our hearts and minds that we might uh, learn this, that someday we would be teachers of Amos as well. Such a rich book. And uh, just thank you for each person that's here this morning that has been faithful to tune in and do the homework and all that's required. Thank you for John, who's just been brilliant and uh, bringing out all that um, Amos offers. Uh, just pray you'd bless out Tom this morning, uh, each one. And God give us a, a great weekend in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Barry. So good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you here on this very warm morning. We're going to have a very hot day. In fact, there's a warning out for the next 10 days about the severe heat that we're going to be suffering. So if any of you do venture outside, be aware that even though you might not feel like you're sweating, you are dehydrating. And be very careful because in this kind of heat, you can dehydrate very quickly and get quite ill, especially if you're uh, if you're over 60. That's something that we all have to really be aware of. So please be careful, loved ones, if you go out there because it's it can be dangerous. And uh, heat stroke is something that you certainly don't want to... Uh, to underestimate. It can be quite uh, quite difficult. So be careful with that as you go outside. So we are studying in the book of Amos, and we will be concluding one chapter today and beginning another. And this is our minor prophet study. So with that introduction, let's go ahead and review the passage that we read last week, Amos chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Again, I'm going to offer you my amplified version, which has the blue taken from the King James Bible, and I've added in black words taken from the interlinear Bible from the original Hebrew to help us to understand some of the key words in the English that are not necessarily uh, obvious. So let me go ahead and read this passage that we studied last week, quickly review it, and then work on to today's new material. Hear this word, ye kine, you female cows, the upper class women of Bashan of Jordan, the land of Gad and Reuben, that are in the mountain of Samaria, the capital city of Israel, which oppress and heavily tax the poor who live from day to day, which crush and disable further the needy who lack enough even for a day which say to their masters, their husbands, bring, let us drink and get drunk. The Lord God hath sworn and promised by his holiness and sacredness that, lo, the day shall come upon and wash over you, and he will take you away with hooks and thorns, and your posterity and children who remain with fish hooks. And ye shall go out and be thrown out like a dead body at the breaches in the broken wall. Every cow at that which is before her, and ye shall cast them into the palace harem, saith the Lord. Come to Bethel, where the golden calf idol is worshipped, and transgress down a false path at Gilgal. Multiply transgression and rebellion, and bring your sacrifices in payment every morning, though normally done once a year, and your tithes for three days, though normally done every three years and offer to burn and send up in smoke a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven that contaminates the offering, and proclaim and publish the free offerings. For this pleases you, O children of the kingdom of Israel, saith the Sovereign Lord. So this is a really fascinating passage that we've already looked at, particularly the last half of it, verse 4 and 5, where we see one of the finest examples of biblical sarcasm recorded in the book of the Bible, where he essentially tells them, come and practice your false religion and see if it makes a difference. Uh, you who think that 
by not doing the quality that I require, the quantity that you offer will make up for it. Well, it won't. And it doesn't suffice. And uh, uh, you can go ahead and continue to fool yourself. So it's a, it's a great example of biblical sarcasm in verses 4 and 5. Uh, we learned that the oppressors he's speaking to in these first verses are the aristocratic wealthy women. He calls them the fat cows of Israel. And they became rich at the expense of the poor and needy. And it's interesting to me how he designates the difference in the Hebrew between poor and needy, where the poor are the people who live from day to day, where they're just getting by with what they have, where the needy are those who don't even have enough for a day. And they're continually in need and continually in want. And if they don't have the support and help of others, they won't survive. So there's an interesting difference between poor and needy. I never realized that difference from the English, but when I saw it in the Hebrew, it became very clear that there's a very distinct difference between these two groups. And he says they're going to be avenged because these wealthy women are going to be thrown through a break in the fortress wall. Their life is going to crumble. And they who used to be the ones who were the bosses and in charge of all these poor people, they are going to become part of the harem of the king of Assyria. And they are going to become the slaves of this foreign king. And Amos accentuates the licentiousness, the luxury, the oppressiveness of the ruling classes in Israel. How they took their wealth and they used that to oppress the poor. And they ignored their coming fate. And that they are going to go from extreme extravagance to utter enslavement. And it's a very interesting passage of contrasts. Now, use, you, Amos also uses extreme religious sarcasm here to illustrate that the people are practicing idolatry. They're worshiping false gods and those falsely. And their obstinate resistance to God's chastisement and punishment isn't working. And here's another good, interesting word pair that we get from Amos, chastisement and punishment, where chastisement is discipline or correction, and punishment is, is a wages for your, your sin or your action. So chastisement is not necessarily punishment. It's setting back to the correct path, where punishment is a punitive measure that is meant to bring pain for the uh, transgression that you have done. And God has used both of these, chastisement and punishment, on Israel to try to bring them back to the proper path, and it didn't do any good. The passage also addresses that people's attempt to have pseudo-religious activities, and uh, they think if they do what they do more often, it will make up for what they don't do that God has asked them to do. And God recognizes their falseness and their insincerity, and simply increasing quantity of what you do doesn't replace the corrupted quality of the way you're doing it. So I thought this uh, this first five verses was very uh, interesting in teaching us through these word pairs uh, what God is pronouncing upon them as Assyria approaches. Are there any questions about the first five verses that we studied last week? Okay, chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and want of bread in all your places. Yet have ye not returned to me, saith the Lord. And also I have withholden the rain from you, when there were yet three months to the harvest. And I caused it to rain upon one city, and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. So let's add in a few key words here in the Hebrew to get the meaning. What does cleanness of teeth mean? I thought that was a really interesting expression. I have also given you cleanness of teeth. What does that mean? Is it health? Health? 
Okay. Anyone else? Hunger. Hunger. It's hunger. That's right. Yeah. There's no food stuck in your teeth because you have no food to eat. Usually when you eat grain, the husks of the grain will come in between the teeth. And as those husks, you know, like you, when you eat popcorn and you get those little shells kind of stuck between your teeth. And if you don't get them out of there, they infect the whole jaw. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But here, cleanness of teeth is there's no husks because there's no grain. And there's no grain because he's given them want of bread. See, want of bread and cleanness of teeth go together. The cleanness of teeth is famine. The want of bread is starvation. So as a result of the fact that they have clean teeth because there's nothing to eat, so they're starving. And that's what's going to come upon them during the siege when the Assyrians come to take Israel away. But the expression cleanness of teeth, it sounds almost like a good thing. You want your teeth clean, but here it's a very bad thing. There's no food to make your teeth have those husks in them. It's kind of interesting. Then the next word is he not only gives them cleanness of teeth, which is famine, and want of bread, which is starvation. He withholds the rain. So that's drought. So we see him bringing famine and starvation as chastisement or correction, and drought as punishment. And you can see how all of these are related. The drought dries up the crops, so there is nothing to eat, and your teeth are clean. And because your teeth are clean and there's nothing to eat, you're starving because you have no nourishment. And all three of these are kind of woven in together. And three months before the harvest, While the grain was just starting to come up and and show promise, that's when he squashed the whole process by bringing in these hot winds and blowing in these winds and taking the rain away and withholding the rain. And he did it in a peculiar way, didn't he? He caused it to rain upon one city, but not another. So he punished one, but didn't punish another. And the one that he punished, what did they do in response to the fact that he didn't bring them rain. What did they do? They traveled to the cities that did have the rain for drink. So they sought a human solution. They went to other men who had water to ask them for the water. What should they have done? Prayed to God for rain, and they didn't. It's interesting. So again, here we see their idolatry has reached to the point where they no longer are acknowledging God as the supplier of the rain, and they go to other cities, and that that one city doesn't have enough for the three that didn't get the rain. So that puts the whole system in stress. So seeking the solutions of men is not the answer. And Amos is telling us that in a very peculiar way, by saying he brought the drought that resulted in the cleanness of teeth, that resulted in starvation, and then people would travel to other cities of men to seek from them the uh, salve for their illness that they brought upon themselves because they didn't acknowledge God, and they sought the water from these other cities rather than praying to God that he would rain on them and give them the water that they need. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water, and that would quickly deplete the supply of the one city. And that's why they were not satisfied. They were not filled. So the whole system then suffered, even those who God continued to give rain to. This is a very interesting passage. All right. So notice... Hey, John. Wouldn't, yes. I communi- oh, wouldn't I communicate that God was in charge? It wasn't a freak of nature? Well, of course it does. But that yeah. doesn't mean people recognized it. Yeah. I know. They did, you, but- you, you recognize it but because you're in the Lord. But they didn't recognize it because they were in the idols. Yeah. And so they, 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 know, they had lost the sensitivity to the presence of God. And, and that's got to be the saddest thing of all here, that they have a helper. They have a deliverer. They have a savior, 
And they're insensitive to it. They don't even know anymore because they've been so dependent on their own resources and of their fellow men, and they so rejected God and everything that he's created. They don't want his creation. They don't want the way he's made things. They want to identify it in a different way. We see that today. They thought it was climate change. What's that? They thought it was climate change. There you go. I couldn't have said it better. And I'm glad you said it instead of me. Yeah, they they blamed it there instead of acknowledging God. Exactly. God tried to get their attention with his various natural mechanisms, and it didn't make any difference. They still didn't repent. They didn't recognize this is a message from our Lord telling us we strayed from the path. They ignored that and continued to stray from the path. Now, I want you to look at the verbs here. I have given you. I have withholden. Yeah, it's not climate change, as Ryan says. It's God. God has caused this. Not the natural effects of the planet, but God has done it. I caused it to rain. See, God is speaking directly to them through Amos and saying, I am responsible for your condition. Wake up. Pay attention. Don't get woke. Get awakened. That's what he's calling for. Now, in verse 6, he used chastisement. And how did he do? How did that work? (laughs) It didn't. It didn't work at all. He subjected them to famine and hunger, to the armies of locusts he sent on their crops. You know, that's just like Joel. We see Joel, same thing happening there. He's the God of hosts, the God of armies, armies of men and armies of insects as well. So in verse 7, he brought low rainfall or drought and withheld the spring rains just before the summer harvest to wither the grain on the stalk. He showed them what they could have. He showed them the potential. And then when they didn't respond, he took it away by taking away the rain. And they couldn't help each other, even though that's the route they tried to take. So the result of these chastisements was nothing. They refused to return to God. They refused to repent of their sin. When I read this, immediately what came into mind was the day of the Lord when God is going to visit the world for sin and pour out his wrath on the sons of disobedience. Look at Revelation 9, 20, 21. It says this. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not. It's the same thing happening in the future during the tribulation. They repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, the idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So we see the same thing is going to happen in the future. When God brings these bowls, And he brings all of these plagues and all of these chastisements and punishments. It's not going to make a difference. There aren't going to be people coming to the Lord during this time period. As many teach, it's not going to happen. They do not repent of the works of their hands. They do not repent of their evil sins. And because they don't repent, they're not going to benefit from the forgiveness of God. Revelation 16, 11 says it this way, and cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores, yet they did not repent of their deeds. Instead of going to God and asking him to relieve their pain and confessing to them their sin and asking him to deliver them from the punishment, they curse God instead and blame him for their condition Instead of confessing, they are responsible for their condition. So it's interesting how Amos ties into Revelation here, into the far field forecast in the future of the end days, the end times, the latter days, when he will come and bring tribulation, and still these people will not 
respond and come back to him. In the future, God's wrath on those who remain here, <clears throat> they will also refuse to repent and turn to God. <clears throat> Luke 12.10 says this, And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. This is what I think this means when you refuse to repent. The Holy Spirit comes and calls you to repentance. The Holy Spirit comes and calls you back to God. And you blaspheme the Holy Spirit by turning away. And when you turn away from the Holy Spirit, you close the only door that's open to you, to God. And by blaspheming the Holy Spirit and rejecting that call to repentance, you have doomed yourself and removed yourself from the power of forgiveness. That's what I believe the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is. The unforgivable sin is when he calls you to repent and invites you back and you say no. And we see that's going to happen in the future in Revelation. We see that happen with Israel and the Assyrians came to them. We saw that happen in Judah and the Babylonians came to them. We see that happening in America and we see what's happening here. God's giving America another chance now. Will they repent and turn back? Judah did for a time. Remember when we looked at the kings? They turned back to God and he gave them more time. He rolled out his wrath on them. And they were a nation longer, but they eventually rejected God also and turned back to their idols and sacrificed their children to Asheroth. And eventually he held them accountable and visited their sin. What will America do? Will they repent or will they blaspheme the Holy Ghost, the unforgivable sin, and bring God's wrath sooner? The, what are you going to do, America? Yeah, Go ahead. John, when you... I, I struggle with this a little bit in that it, are these believers that are rejecting the Holy Ghost because a non-believer doesn't have a Holy Ghost. And so if this is believers now reject, rejecting and blaspheming the Holy Ghost, convicting them, I'm not going to say they lose their salvation. I'm not saying that, but I struggle with the, the meaning of this. I've seen it before. And since you brought it up, <laughs> explain that. Is this non-believers? Or are these believers who have the Holy Ghost, but don't listen to the Holy Ghost, they blaspheme the Holy Ghost, and now are not forgiven? So, so I want you to picture an assembly. I want you to picture a congregation of people who have gathered together. Within that congregation, there are some who believe. There are some who are not, who do not believe, who are hardened, decided they will not believe. They have rejected God. And then there's the people in between, the journeyers that are on a journey, and they're still looking, and they're still seeking, and they're still somewhat open and pliable. So we've got this this mixture, this conglomerate of people who are receiving a message from the Holy Ghost, okay? And he's walking among them. He's standing next to those who are saved. He's standing next to those who are not. And he's standing next to those who are seeking. And I think this is to the seekers. And I think this is speaking to those who have, have not made a decision yet and are still on the line and unless they make a decision for god they're making a decision against god and rejecting the calling of the holy spirit to stop their evil ways and stop their lukewarm attitude and get on board that's what i think is happening that's a good point uh, that's a good way to put it it's a confusing passage, and you can look at it different ways, particularly when it says that if you speak against the Son of Man, well, that's Jesus, it will be forgiven. But you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you're out of luck, man. Yeah, well, the Holy Spirit is the one who brings the conviction in the heart. 
that right. brings you to God. And if you reject that heart change, then you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And without the change of heart, you're not forgiven. That's how I see it. So I like to use the analogy of the assembly and the group of assembly and the Holy Spirit walking through that assembly with his invitation. And we're seeing the response of various people within that assembly. That's how I would offer it to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. You're welcome. Anyone else? Brian, you look like you have something to say, sir. Do you have something? No, not this time. Okay, good. You were kind of straightening up in your chair, so I thought you were getting ready to say something. <laughs> it's great to have you back, by the way. It's good to see you. All right. Verses 4 and 9. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased. The palmer worm devoured them. Yet have ye not returned to me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses and I've made the stink of your camps to come up into your nostrils. Yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Do you see the effort God is making to bring his people back? To get their attention? To chastise them? To help them to realize he is sovereign Lord, and they only can be saved through him. And he brings the blasting and the mildew and the palmer worm and the pestilence and the war and the stink and all of these things to them to try to draw them back to him. And it doesn't work. They say, no, they have not returned to the Lord. So let's put some words in here. What is blasting? I've smitten you with blasting. What is that? Wind. Wind. Exactly. It's wind. It's blasting wind. Now the wind, where is this wind coming from? The Sahara the Lord. It's coming from the Lord, and what direction is he blowing it in from? It's probably coming from the east. It's coming from the east over the dry land, so it's a hot, scorching wind, okay? And that causes mildew. That causes, the mildew here is a blight that comes from the hot Sorokin winds that blow over the coastlands of the Mediterranean as they come off the desert lands to the east. So if you know the geography, this makes perfect sense. And the gardens and the vineyards and the fig trees and the olive trees, all of those are accosted by the wind. And then after the drought, the wind comes and dries them up. Who does he send in next? The palm worm. <laughs> yeah. And who, that's our friendly locust guy. All right. Yeah. The caterpillar or the locust comes in to finish off what's left and devour what's there. Okay. And that did not bring them back to the Lord. It should have, but it didn't. That chastisement, that punishment did not bring them back. Then he sends the pestilence or the plagues after the manner of Egypt. Okay. And you can go to Exodus 9 and read 1 through 7 if you wish and see about those. Okay. And then he sent to the mighty men, he has sent war to slay them by the sword. And then he's captured the horses. These are the chariot horses that were used to defend Israel. He's taken those away. And then this one, he's made the stink, the stench of sweat and the latrines and the urine and the feces and the rotten food and the death from the slaughter, the horrible, rotten smell that just permeates every inch of your body and your clothing stink and your hair stinks and your beard reaches from the stench of death. I hope I've painted a clear picture of how horrible that is. Okay. 
And he still didn't return to the Lord. It still didn't work. They ignored it. He gave them multiple chances to repent and return, and they insistently refused to do so. Not only here, in Israel's time and Judah's time, but also I've shown you in two places in Revelation where we see that happening in the latter days as well. When the sons of disobedient remain disobedient and do not change their ways, and they are not saved, they are not delivered. Any questions? Inhale a deep breath and be glad it's not the stench of those camps. Okay. So the additional chastisements that God brought is he sent the Sirocco wind, and I've spelled it for you here. The Sirocco wind came off the desert and it brought a paleness to the crops. The word here for blight is a paleness. It dried out. When the crops have moisture, they're colored. They have the color of the moisture. As the winds blow over them and sucks out that moisture, they become pale and become blighted. And it's a, there's a fungus that infests the crops and damages them. He also brought the palmer worm caterpillar. And remember, we met him in Joel, and they stripped the crops to bare wood. And then he sent a pestilence or a plague like those that he sent to Egypt. Then he topped it all off with devastating war that slaughtered their young men, the best of their warriors, and resulted in the loss of their chariot horses so they could neither defend themselves and they couldn't escape either because the chariots were a means of escape as well. And that was removed. The end result is an Israeli camp filled with the stench of death, dying and rotted and stinky in their own filth from the pestilence and the death of the wounded. John, it's interesting that the pestilence in Egypt is different than this one. In Egypt, all the Egyptian cattle died, but not the cattle of the uh, uh, Israelites. They survived. That's right. Yep. God is selective, like he reigns on one city and not another. We see that continually. All right, Amos 4.11. I have overthrown some of you. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning, yet have ye not returned to me. You, you getting this expression here, yet have ye not returned to me? Amos is explaining to the people, God tried so many things, so many times, and you would not, you would not acknowledge him. You would not return to him, saith the Lord. Verse 12. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel. Because I will do this unto thee. Now listen to these words and tremble. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. <laughs> Those are words you do not want to hear unless you believe in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, those are the words you're looking for. Interesting. Same words. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. For lo, he that formeth the mountains, and createth the wind, and declareth unto man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness, and treadeth upon the high places of the earth, the Lord. The God of hosts is his name. Now, this passage does an absolutely beautiful job of reintroducing to them exactly who God is in a very unique way. Let's plug in some Hebrew. We're going to see that. This is very fascinating. 
I have overthrown means to turn away from. I've turned away from some of you, okay? Just as God turned away from Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, you who have refused to repent and return to me, prepare to stand before thy God. That's what the word to meet means. You're going to stand before God. For lo, he that formeth the mountains and created the wind and declareth, he announces unto man. The trumpet is sounded. And he announces his judgment. He's coming now to visit the sin. He is the one who makes the morning darkness. And he treads upon the high places that were lifted up where they go to worship to get closer to their idols. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. So how does God describe his judgment here? How does he describe it? He destroyed their cities, but he spared them from total defeat by exiling them and leaving a residue. Their rescue is likened to a burning firebrand snatched from the blaze before being entirely consumed. So it's a log burning in the fire, and before the whole thing is consumed, he snatches a remnant out. Here we see fire being used as a picture of judgment, and it doesn't thoroughly consume, but it leaves a remnant. This is a refiner's fire. A refiner's fire is to burn off the ash and burn off the dross and burn off the contaminants and leave the gold, the remnant behind. Israel will be saved from complete ruin at the last moment. This is a look into the latter days. Now, verse 12 is particularly chilling, or it should be. Prepare, securely stand to meet against your God in battle. Here he comes. Now, would, yes. Would, would that be applicable to every person that's ever lived, prepared to meet your God? That's what we're not doing, regardless of the circumstances around us. That's correct. And in, in, in the next few words, Amos is going to tell us who this God is that we're going to meet. And he does it in a very unusual way. Okay, When, when you read here, Verse 12 and verse 13, there's a particular description of God that I want to extract from this for you. And I'm going to show it to you now. And this is going to show you who this God is that you will stand before. Number one, it says he formed the mountains. You notice that? Mm -hmm. For lo, he that formeth the mountains. The word here for mountains is the earth. He is the creator of the earth. He formed the mountains. Number two, well for, this is God the Father. God the creator is the one who created the earth and formed the mountains. Number two is he created the wind. And the word here for wind in the Hebrew is the word that translates to pneuma in Greek for the spirit. So he comes as creator, and he also comes as God, the Holy Spirit. Now, you know where I'm going, and I want you to look at it again. And I want you to look who you're preparing to meet, the creator who made the mountains, the Spirit of God, and the one that announces to man his judgment. Who does that? Jesus Christ renders his judgment to mankind. This is a Trinity verse in the Old Testament. How amazing is that? So here's the Trinity, God the Father in the creator of the mountains, God the Holy Spirit who comes with the wind, and God the Son who brings judgment to mankind. There's the Trinity right there in Amos. Fascinating. That's the God whom we will stand before. Any questions? Did anybody recognize the Trinity there before I showed him to you? Mm -hmm. Well, 
I, I had a question as to verse 11 to start with was the I have overthrown is the I, Jesus Christ. Because now he refers to God that overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah as a different person than I. So who's the I that's speaking in verse 11 versus the I's throughout the thing? So Exactly. You're exactly right. That's who it is. And we see him described here as the Trinity together moving between his three roles at will because he's three in one not three separate gods this isn't polytheism this is monotheism one god in three persons so he can call himself i when he's creating he can call himself i when he's convicting as the holy spirit and he can call himself i when he goes to the cross to die in our place it's the same god three in one the trinity here's my point ladies and gentlemen the trinity is not an old a new testament concept it's an old testament concept here it is we can see it absolutely magnificent now he continues look at this dave you in particular dave he makes the morning darkness when did the morning become darkness when christ hung on the cross is this a reference to Christ on the cross? I think so. The I who's speaking here. You were a little bit ahead of me, my brother, but that's okay. You often are, and that's good. <laughs> and then he tramples the fortress of idolatry. He will bring his wrath at the end against the sons of disobedience. And he is the sovereign Lord. And remember, sovereign Lord is the owner, the one who paid the price, mercy. Amos is describing Jesus Christ. That's exactly right. That just stuns me when I when I recognize that. It's stunning in the Old Testament. Any questions? There's treasure in these minor prophets there's treasure and we'll find it john yes can go I ahead observe something here you um, can all of what you said I, I i i have no argument with whatsoever uh i brought it to as recent as uh covid19 who brought covid19 we don't know right but who allowed COVID-19 to infect the world in America greatly? Our own God, because he is in control. He didn't bring it, but he allowed it. So here we go. It's his judgment. It's the morning darkness. When did the morning darkness come? The morning darkness came when we saw the deaths coming from uh, COVID. The, 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 uh, uh, what, what did we say, the utility or whatever of the, uh, the fortress of idolatry, tramples the fortress of idolatry. What is our idol in COVID-19? Tell vaccine. me. The vaccine. Say again. The vaccine. Science and the vaccine, yes. We touted that. Did you ever hear anyone in authority, anybody, say, let's pray? No. I think this is, I'm, I'm sure you can take it through a lot of wars and plagues and et cetera, but the most recent in my mind and what brought this to mind was the fact that we, we have this fortress of idolatry, which we call science. And I know we have science scientists in this group, and I'm not putting any science down or a scientist, but when we rely on, yes, John, when we <laughs> rely on science and not on our maker, we're verging right here, I think. That's it. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? And what is this God's name? The Lord, the sovereign Lord, the God of hosts, the God of armies is his name. This is with whom we're dealing with. And Amos is again instructing Israel. 
and instructing Judah and instructing America and the church today of who this God is with which we deal. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Well, it's interesting what Herb mentioned is that COVID-19, that was not the first plague that hit the world, obviously. No. The, the worst and most widespread, yes. Uh, but the fact is, they seem to be getting worse, and we seem to not be returning to God, but returning to man to fix it. And I, I think that is what I got out of what you said. That's my, my point, Dave. Correct. Okay, anyone else? Okay. So I want to show you something that's really interesting. We've been talking about chastening. And what is chastening? Let's redefine it. How did I define mm -hmm. chastening? Bringing us back to the right path. Okay, it's correcting. Good. Correcting, yeah. Correcting or bringing back to the right path. Well, we have just gone through Amos and looked at a series of chastenings that God has brought to the people. Those same chastenings also occur in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and 1 Kings. And it's fascinating. Hunger and famine is described in Amos 4.6, in Leviticus 26, in Deuteronomy 28, and in 1 Kings 8. The withheld reins, again, that's where they're all described. There's a parallelism between these four books of the Bible that repeat the same message from God. It wasn't the message he gave only to Amos. He also relayed that message to us through Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and 1 Kings. Now, Leviticus and Deuteronomy are books of the law. First Kings is a book of history, and Amos is a prophet. What do you have here? The law and the prophets. That's how he communicates to us, and that's how he's communicating this same message. The blight and mildew is in all four. The caterpillar and locust is not in Leviticus. Oh, there's our little friend there. Remember him? The plagues of Egypt, wars, and so forth. And you can put this table together and see these parallel renderings repeated in Scripture over and over and over. If God repeats something once, you need to pay attention to it. If he repeats it three times, you need to really study it. If he repeats it four times, it's very important. And these chastisements are very important. And so we can look at ourselves and say, where is God chastising us that we're not paying attention to? And open up our awareness and pray, Holy Spirit, open our eyes. Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our nation. Holy Spirit, open the hearts of our leaders. Holy Spirit, God, the Father, God, the Son. Bring your chastisement to have meaning to them so they will stop what they're doing and return and acknowledge you as God and repent. Because it doesn't have to go the way it's going. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, look at the words, blasting, you don't see that every day, mildew, Locust, if there be caterpillar, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be. That is exactly what Amos just said, and it's in 1 Kings chapter 8. It's amazing. Solomon, who wrote it, knew. Deuteronomy 28 says this. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he have consumed thee from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation 
and with an extreme burning, and with the sword, and with, here it is, blasting and mildew. See it? And they shall pursue thee till thou perish. Who? That's the locusts. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron, hard, dry. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. These are the words of Amos. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. That's the diaspora in the latter days. And thy carcass shall be meat to the fowls of the air and under the beasts of the earth and no man shall fray them away. The Lord will smite thee. Here's the place with the botch of Egypt and with the emeroids or hemorrhoids and with the scab and with the itch whereof thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. It's amazing how we see this message repeated in scripture. The pestilence will cleave to thee a consumption and fever and inflammation, the botch of Egypt. In Amos, he calls it the plagues of Egypt. Blasting and mildew, that brings the drought. Smitten before thine enemies is the ravages of war and defeat. Moses knew. Amos has told us that doesn't God reveal what he's going to do to his prophets? Yeah, he does. And he did. And they reveal it to us if we read it and study. The minor prophets. <laughs> They're not minor. Amazing. All right. So this is the passage, the chapter we've been in. God took action, yet they returned not to him. He took additional action, and yet they returned not to him. And it went on and on and on. And God is patient. But his patience has an end. And he has chastised. And he has punished and the people will not return. Therefore, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. O Judah. O America. Does anyone have any questions? It's pretty clear, isn't it? John, yes. the use of the word return and the use of the word repent uh, has an implication that the listener, the individuals that are being chastised and punished, have at one time been there and done that but that they are no longer there or doing that. Now, it would seem to me that the message for repentance and returning is a message to the believer. The unbeliever hasn't been there and hasn't done that. So the, it's difficult for a message to be sent to someone who has no clue. But those of us who are not clueless are given clues in this minor prophecy by Amos for us to repent and return. Well said. Amen. Anyone else? Any other final questions or comments on Amos chapter 4? What a great chapter. 
It is. It, John, I, it's like a light bulb and the light being switched on. It really is. Good. Anyone else? All right, before we move from Amos chapter 4, David, any final word? Just frightening to know that if you compare where we are right now in this world and where the United States is, is aren't we being told the same message and ignoring it across the board? So. Yeah, and, and you know, the encouraging, there's actually an encouraging opportunity in there in that there is hope, though. Amos does leave for us a hope that there can be returning. You know, we don't know which of these ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Are, are we in this one or are we in this one? Are we in this one or are we in this one? I don't know which one we're in, but there is still hope for return. I believe there's still hope for revival. There is still hope. Eventually, the Bible tells us it will all fail and man will turn against God and the Antichrist will come and the end times will unveil and the latter days will fulfill scripture. That will come. But it doesn't have to be next year. That's the hope. Any questions? Any comments? We're out of time, so we'll just stop here. We finished up chapter 4, which is how Israel exploited the poor and the needy and how they refused to repent. Chapter 5 is going to bring us here to injustice and a call for individual repentance. So Amos addresses the nation, and now he addresses the nationals. He addressed the entire mass. Now he's addressing the individuals. That's where we're headed. And then we're also going to see the religious hypocrisy addressed on the day of the Lord. And that's where we're going next week. And as we continue on in chapter five and see these next two messages unveiled in, uh, in Amos. All right. With that, may I ask for a volunteer, please, to step up and close us in prayer? And we can uh, end the lesson for today. Would someone close us in prayer, please? Thank you. I'll do it. We thank you, Lord, for this day, for your word, for, the, for just teaching us, Lord, in its own simplicity. Why don't we hear it? So give us ears to hear as well as the words. Lord, we pray that you guide and direct every step. We thank you that you're concerned with not only the history of our lives and of the world, but also our own individual history. We thank you for the teaching. We thank you for John and his diligence. We pray that we would be guided and directed uh, safely to a point where we will say, the Lord is our God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.